Well, everyone, welcome back to a very exciting episode of the Storybox podcast. My friends, I have been waiting for this conversation for quite some time, ever since I found out that I'd be interviewing this amazing human being. But Dr. Martha Beck, now if that name does not ring a bell to you, why? Go and go and research this incredible woman. But she is a multiple times New York Times bestselling author, life coach, and speaker. She was on Jay Shetty's podcast recently, which I absolutely loved. And my only complaint was it didn't go longer. Uh, but hopefully today we might go longer. Who knows? Uh, she has spent a lifetime offering powerful, practical, and entertaining teachings that help people improve every aspect of their lives. Her written work includes several New York Times bestselling books and international bestsellers as well. And she has uh, been in a, over 150 uh, magazine articles. She holds three Harvard degrees in social sciences. So I've basically uh, outdone myself here in this conversation. So I don't really hold up to it. <laughs> but <laughs> Oprah Winfrey has called her one of the smartest women that she knows. Damn, <laughs> that is insane. Uh, imagine having that on your resume. And she, I'm excited to sell, tell you guys about her new book called The Way of Integrity. And in this book, Martha offers or presents basically four stage processes that anyone can use to find integrity and with it, a sense of purpose and emotional healing. How many of us actually need that in one's life? And a life free of mental suffering, much of what plagues us people, pleasing, worry, anxiety, negative habits, the whole bit. It's all in this book. It's honestly amazing. I've been skimming through it. Can't wait to have this conversation with you. But Martha, Martha Beck, welcome so much to the Storybox podcast. Uh, thank you. I think we're done here. You <laughs> praise me for 20 minutes, and then we leave. <laughs> I think we can that. just end the conversation right there, right? <laughs> so. It's, it's truly, truly an honor to have you here. I mean, oh, the honor I, is all mine, Jay. I love the title of your book. Um, and it's, it's a particular topic that I'm interested in. I mean, integrity, I was just saying to you before, integrity is something that we all have, we all need in our life, but actually knowing fully what it actually is, is an important yeah. thing in one's life. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm pumped. So before we dive into all of it, I keep saying that I'm pumped because it really means that I am. But uh, I have one question to sort of start off this conversation officially with, and that is, what does success look like for you? Hmm. Uh, success is actually um, a sampling of experiences resting in a bed of peace. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a kind of inner peace that is actually not emotional and you cannot get, I've been to different mountaintops looking for it, you know, academically in the world of celebrity and all that. And it, it doesn't, that's not where it is, folks. That is not where it is. If you can come to a sense of inner peace that, um, you know, it's scripturally called, scripturally called the peace that passeth all understanding mm -hmm. because it, permeates your life no matter what mood you're in no matter what's happening to you even when you're facing tragedy and that just living in that is like it's like waking up healthy after being sick and just basking in the feeling of being one's whole self that is it's blissful that's yeah. success you have a, a chapter two in your book is actually titled desperate for success i'm mm, wondering yeah. if you're able to unbox that a little bit more and and did you actually uncover inner peace and in that particular chapter um well i talk about the beginning of it uh the whole concept of integrity it's not that sort of sunday school morality that it sometimes carries in the language it just means whole intact mm. So for me, being in integrity means that you're, all your pieces are aligned and in harmony with one another. So if a plane is in structural integrity, it's all working as one, it can fly. If it falls out of integrity, it may crash. It's nobody's, you know, it's not a sin. It's just what happens. Mm -hmm. So if we're, we come into this life whole and intact with our true nature. And then we immediately run into the opposite of that, which is culture. <laughs> and culture tells us how to modify our behavior to please other people. And we're built to do that. And so almost before we can learn to talk, we have abandoned our true selves in many ways to please other people. And the definition of success is then set by the culture. Mm 
And because we've abandoned our true self to please other people, we don't even know that what we're going after doesn't feel right to us. And sometimes we'll be very, very far gone um, along the road of suffering before we finally go, wait, this, this simply isn't working. What's wrong? And then we go on a search for wholeness, mm. which is what happened to me. Mm. So we're talking about culture and my curiosity around culture has always been Firstly, how can we actually break free from our culture? Because usually if we want to break free, there's fear associated with that because yeah. we're going away from the norm that we've been as associated with literally our, our entire life. Yeah. So yeah. how can we really break free from it? It's not easy at first. It's simple, but it's not easy. The simple way is to find, uh, Pascal said that all our misery comes from the fact that we're unable to sit quietly alone in a room. Because when you sit quietly alone in a room, your truth comes up. There's nobody to push it back down. So if you go off by yourself and say, what am I actually feeling? What do I really, what am I feeling that I don't want to admit I feel? What do I know that I wouldn't admit to anyone that I know? You just start looking for the information that's already available to you, but you keep it suppressed, again, to please other people. So one of the things I do when I speak to audiences is stop right in the middle of the speech and say, is everyone comfortable? Mm -hmm. And they're like, yes. I say, really seriously, are you comfortable? And they get quite irritated. They're like, yes, we're fine, move on. And then I say, how many of you, if you were sitting at home right now, would be sitting in the position you're in at this moment? And of course, no one raises a hand. And then I say, why? And it takes these brilliant people a good minute or two to figure out, oh, I'm really not very comfortable. And the problem isn't that they're uncomfortable. It's not a horrible thing. But the problem is that they genuinely believed they were comfortable, while at the same moment, knowing with their entire physical system that they were uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So the way to get back to integrity is to say, something's not comfortable. I'm going to go sit quietly alone in a room and look at the discomfort. And that is super scary. And if it leads you to take actions that run contrary to any aspect of your culture, family culture, ethnic culture, national, anything, um, you're going to be afraid of pushback from other people. And that's a justified fear. Mm. But facing pushback is better than losing your soul. Mm. At least that's my premise. I think it's, it's very difficult, at least like the journey that I've been on and I'm only 24. So it's, I'm still relatively young. And I've, relatively. Been, I've been on this journey of I've been in a lot of uncomfortable situations and I've actually done some of the, the uncomfortable situations myself, like yeah. <laughs> brought myself in them because I, I knew that being in that uncomfortable situation was going to lead me to the comfortable later on. But right. you don't stay, I've always been curious about this. You don't actually stay comfortable for very long in your life. Uh, mm. You have something else that comes in your life that you sort of shakes you up a little bit. Uh, yeah. so is it actually possible to always be in a place of sheer integrity of wholeness or are we just constantly going through this, this journey of life? I call it the roller coaster ride, you know, like we go yeah. down yeah. the steep slopes, sharp turn, jagged ed edges. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's what it it's all about. Mean? That's the condition of this life, but I don't, I don't like suffering. This is my major concern in life. So um, I sort of went on a journey from my own, from being 24 myself. That's when I had my first big shakeup. I was a doctoral candidate at Harvard and um, my unborn son was diagnosed with Down syndrome, like right at the limit when I could possibly have terminated and I chose not to. I am pro-choice, but it just wasn't right for me at the time. Mm -hmm. And it wrenched me away from the Harvard culture. And I, it was, and I was grieving deeply and my advisors and doctors told me I was throwing away my life, which was true. Um, but the life I was throwing away was making me miserable. And the life that I went to instead has been really, really joyful. Mm -hmm. So what I found is that life goes up and down and up and down and up and down. You could say that everything's a birth of joy and a death of joy. So birth and death, birth and death, but the opposite of Death is not life. The opposite of death is birth. Mm. Life has no opposite. So we suffer. We go up and down on this roller coaster and around and around. But if we can stop 
identifying with the culture, if we can find our integrity, we become the field through which the, the roller coaster is moving mm -hmm. as well as experiencing the roller coaster. So um, I get like I just heard that a friend of mine has cancer that may be terminal mm -hmm. and it my heart hits a sharp turn, you know, and it's <gasps> scary. And at the very same time, I'm in this place of complete quiet and love and absolute conviction that there is no. Uh, disruption in our in the connection between loving energy. I just, if you get to integrity, you start to develop that sense of peace. And the roller coaster is just fun after that, as weird as that sounds. So I want to go back a little bit because you mentioned your your son actually has Down syndrome. Now I've worked mm -hmm. with disabled people for a period of time of my life. Absolutely love them. They're <laughs> some of the best human beings on the face of the earth. They say it like it is. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I've got some very funny stories. Um, of <laughs> I bet you do. Them. But one, one thing that I love about disabled people is they're always honest. Like they'll, yeah. they'll tell you directly. Um, yeah. But what I'm fascinated by for you, Martha, is why didn't you terminate your son at the time? Well, they're, they're on hangs a tail. This is very weird. Like I was very, I'd been raised very, very religious and then just, it did not work for me. So then I went into complete like rational atheist sort of thinking. Um, but from the moment that I got pregnant, the moment that my son was conceived, I started to have experiences that were inexplicable. You'd have to call them psychic. I knew what was happening to people I loved when they were far away I knew things were going to happen a certain way. I was saved from a burning building by someone who did not show up on the TV cameras that were filming the whole event, like really uncanny things started to happen to me. And it got, I was more and more curious and it seemed linked to this kid. So I really, by the time I got the diagnosis at 24 weeks, I was, I'd seen him sucking his finger on the ultrasound and everything. So he was a real baby to me already. And, um, I was thinking, what is the qualification that makes us eligible for a human life? Mm -hmm. Is it being able to get a Harvard PhD? But because I looked at all the Harvard PhDs around me, and let me tell you, there wasn't a lot of joy. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, so joy is its own excuse for being. And if this child can feel joy, then his life is, is going to be worth having. And by the same token, I shifted the whole ground of my own life to be not, you know, intellectual achievement will make you happy, but I riveted my attention on this search for joy. And you're right. My son is in complete integrity at all times. And he's been one of my greatest teachers. So it was, and he's introduced me to this realm of magic. I got to tell you when he, I have so many stories. I mean, I'm, there are funny ones. And then there are ones that just, will blow your mind that I don't even tell in public because nobody would believe me. And that's one reason I wrote this book, because I believe it's actually a map from misery to a place to miracles. And it goes by way of your own true soul. You rediscover that and you come out of the misery and you go into this place of peace. And instead of being empty and scary, it's full of magic. It's full of miracles. And the more deeply you come into harmony with yourself, the more magic and miracles you see. And my son taught me that. I have to agree with you. I would actually believe in those stories. <laughs> so I actually want to go into a story that you haven't necessarily shared in the book about your uh -huh. son and you don't really share publicly. I would love to hear one story because I would 1000% believe you <laughs> if you're comfortable with sharing one. Okay. Well, the most dramatic one is that we were, I was, I had a group of friends over once um, I was living in California and there were about 10 people gathered in the living room. We were all talking. And suddenly I saw, I was sitting in front of Adam. He was, I was sitting on the floor and he was in back of me on the couch and there was a window behind him. And suddenly everyone in the room was staring up above my head. And I thought there must be a bear or something but at the window and I turned around and Adam was lying on the couch and he, his head was tilted a little bit back and his eyes were closed and he was holding up his hands and in between his hands, which were about, oh, I don't know, 20 centimeters apart was a ball of 
glowing energy. There was a ball of light between his hands that was moving and changing colors. And he seemed to be playing with it and modifying it. And, and he was just passing the time. Like he was bored with the conversation. He decided to make a ball of light with his hands. And he did that on a few occasions. And in one case, someone had a very bad migraine headache. And I wasn't here at this, but many people were. He went and he put one hand on her head and then he held his other hand up to his face and his hands put out so much light that it was like he'd held a flashlight under his chin. His whole face was lit up and I wasn't there, but I just heard all these people going, oh my God. And he just stayed like that until the headache went away. And that's, those are just a couple of stories. That is a crazy story, but that's a, I don't. I don't usually tell it, but lots of people saw it. I have to agree with you. Like, that is cool. It is cool. Well, and I asked him, where did you learn how to do that? Mm. He doesn't talk much. He said in PE, which is physical education. I don't know if you have it. In, I said, you learned this in gym class? He was <laughs> like, yeah. And what happened was they'd done a week-long unit on yoga. And they taught him some yoga poses, which he kept doing in his room. And he said, if you do them enough, this stuff just happens, which you can find in like the yogic, like legends and things. But I always thought they were, you know, kind of prettied up. But no, he just, he did, did a little yoga, started playing with his energy and um, he's been doing it ever since. <laughs> what has your son taught you about the divine nature of being and your spirit, spirit spirituality, more or less? God. He's just, you know, even when he was a small infant, there was a feeling that here was this tiny body in this crib, this tiny little guy with Down syndrome. And around him was a field of energy so powerful and so majestic that I would, my then husband and I would both go like out and around his crib because the energy coming from the crib was so big and we could have walked straight through it, but it was so strong that we would actually walk around it. <laughs> and then we, we talked to each other about it. It's like, you do that too. Yeah, this is really strange. So there was always this thing of what is his soul doing? And it made me awake to my own soul. I began to believe in soul. I began to believe. In fact, I decided that instead of not believing anything till it was proven true, I would try not disbelieving anything until I was absolutely sure it was false. And actually that took me into my integrity because this absolute adherence to there is no magic in the world. That's just fundamentalism of a different kind. Mm. And so I traded that for open mind, right? Mm. Because what else could I do? This little kid's making balls of light. And um, yeah, he's, he, he awakened my soul and then I could not bear the pain of being separated from my soul at all. And so I started on this path that I now call the way of integrity um, solely for my own healing. And then it turned out that it, it works for other people too. This thing. I am so sorry. Could we- It's all good. Yep. Can it's you edit that? I can. It was on do not disturb. Now it's off. Now it's turned <laughs> off. I, I apologize deeply. It's, do you want me to read? I'll restart at the last, whenever the break was. Where would you like me to start again? The ball of energy, I think. We, we okay. can start there because I did have, um, I did want to sort of go into your own journey and how that came about and sort of some of the things that you learned while on your journey that sort of surprised you. Okay, so you want me to to retell the ball of light or just go from there? Just go from there, basically. So okay. you, you mentioned that you uh, went on this journey of discovering your own integrity, your own yeah. wholeness, own inner peace, that sort of thing. What were some of the things that you learned along the journey that surprised you that you did not expect to actually come into your life? Oh, so many things. I just set out not to tell any lies. At first, that was my, I was, they said the truth will set you free. So I decided the year I turned 29 that I wouldn't tell a lie for the whole year. And I didn't, <laughs> I mean, probably little ones slipped out, but I really, really didn't lie much that year. Mm -hmm. And 
a lot of things surprised me. Um, for example, I realized that I didn't I didn't want to stay in the religion of my forefathers. So I left my religion, which meant leaving my family of origin because it's a very fundamentalist religion. All the friends I'd made before I was 17 um, figured out I was gay. Oh, yeah, that. So there went my marriage, um, left, quit my job, left my left academia, which was the only way I was trained to make money, mm -hmm. uh, left my home. It pretty much ran the gamut of losses. And that was a little bit surprising. Mm. What was a lot surprising was that in the middle of that hurricane of loss, I was living in the eye. It was completely peaceful at my center for the first time ever. And that calm in the eye of the hurricane, it was all I cared about. And so after that year, I just, I sort of set out on a lifelong journey to regain that. And, uh, many years later, I feel like I've, I've put in a lot of practice, enough practice to tell other people, if you go on this path as well, you may also sustain losses, but things magic will happen to you that you have no way of believing right now. It is a much more beautiful world than you know. You mentioned uh, you weren't going to tell a lie, and that is one heck of a hard thing not to do. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. Um, as part of one's character building uh, in, in their life over time, integrity falls into character. I truly believe that. Yeah. Um, so what did you learn more specifically in not telling a lie? Because it is so hard not to tell a lie. Like, so how can we stop ourselves or catch ourselves in the moment of, hey, I'm yeah. not going to tell a lie here? Yeah, studies show that most people tell at least three lies within any 10 minutes of conversation. Yeah. So it's a very, very common thing. The weird thing is that it's also absolute hell on our bodies and emotions. Like the moment you tell a lie, all these indicators of health drop precipitously. Your muscles weaken, your immune system weakens. And that's with a little innocent lie like, oh, yes, I'm completely comfortable when you're not. So the first thing that happens when you decide to stop lying, and I do... I did this very violently. And in the book that I've written, I do it very, very gently. I found that gentleness works so much better than the sort of full speed ahead that I did it with. But um, if you decide to stop lying, which is one of the exercises later in the book, try to take a day, take a week, just see, just see. What happens first is that your mind slows down and you pause a lot. So people say something like, hey, should we go for dinner? And you say, wait a second, <laughs> let me think. And I actually had friends say, you know, when I asked you if you wanted to do something, you paused instead of just saying yes. And I was like, yeah, I pause a lot these days. And actually that pause, that moment before you reflexively answer the way you've been conditioned to answer that is the choice point between suffering and wholeness. Mm. And, but you've got to take that moment. And that really starts with sitting alone in a room by yourself to, to sort of ground in so you can find your center when you're confronted with people. And sometimes you'll just slip and do the old things I still do. And, and then you say, oops, I told you a lie. Mm. It's very common for me to say, somebody in the family will say, did you rinse out that coffee cup? Yes, I'll say. They'll say, really? No, <laughs> we have a lot of those conversations where the first thing out of my mouth is what they want to hear. And the second thing is the truth, but it's happening less and less. And you get, you get quieter, you get calmer. And I learned that from my son too. He's very thoughtful and calm mm. and he's like a little Zen monk that way. So life slows down. Is the extent of the lie, you know how they say, you know, you got small lies, you got massive lies. Is the extent mm -hmm. of the lie, does that impact more on your emotional health and your state of being? Or is it just this, the bigger the lie, the heavier you're going to be feeling? Or is it just lies in general? It's so unfair, Jay, because it's <laughs> lies in general. Mm -hmm. And it's actually the people that are trying hardest to be good that tend to leave their integrity behind 
most. Yeah. So you get your sociopaths and I made sure I interviewed, I, I, my doctorate's in sociology. So when I have an idea, I go and test it on many people who are very different. And I worked with psychopaths, you know, convicted murderers mm -hmm. who had no conscience and they could lie and not have a very big cost internally, but their lives were very, very cold and boring and dull inside. So it's not a life anybody wants to have. Other than that, the people who lie the most are the ones who are trying hardest to be good. And that means conforming to whatever their culture, family, ethnic, et cetera, it says is good. And so without even knowing it, you go pursuing what you've been told to pursue. And then when you decide not to lie, everyone is very surprised <laughs> by discovering your truth. And you probably most of all, but you will have such, there's such a redemption in the way it affects your, your mind, your body, your soul, because really, I mean, the research is crazy. The body hates to lie. And if you lie very much, it will get, you will get sick. Mm. You lose your sense of purpose. Then you lose your emotional stability. Then you, you lose your physical health. Then your career and your relationships go to pot. And then sometimes you develop an addiction. And those six symptoms are the ones that people come to me with most often, and you can resolve them all with integrity. Mm. I love how you mentioned that if you keep lying, you lose your sense of purpose because yeah. you, you create a false sense of purpose, false sense of worth, but it's not, it's not true. It's not real. It's, it's not tangible. Connected. You can't really actually physically attain it. Like, and most people I feel like are going through life that way. It's, yeah, they're telling yeah. themselves all these lies that simply aren't true. That I'm not enough. I'll never be worthy enough. It's like yeah, what yeah, if yeah. scenarios that come into into play. I know yeah. this to be true because that's what I was telling myself for many many years. Wow. Until I until I decided I made the choice to break free from it and start yeah. telling myself the truth. Was then I able to live finally? The, the true version of myself, the authentic version of Jay every single day. It, You're 24 years old and you you are not, it's not finally for you. You are a prodigy of integrity. To be honest. <laughs> I mean, I've had a lot of 70 year olds in my office going, I've never had a purpose. It's time to wake up. You've done it so young. And, and I do think that young people now, because the world is so small, things are happening. You know, the, the global pandemic affected everyone in the world at the same time. And you've got this massive communication that's going instantaneously everywhere. And so the separation from oneself is much more intense and it's much more painful. And so people are awakening to that pain younger and younger. And it does take this massive amount of courage to say, I'm going to, I'm actually going to be true to myself because I need to know my purpose, but I'm really, I think people in your generation are really stepping up much more than my generation. Yeah, they are. And, and one of the reasons why I do what I do is to help. Like I believe my purpose is to help others realize their worth and reach their full potential in life. And we yeah. do that through sharing stories, through getting vulnerable enough to actually share our truth. And yeah. that's the hardest part. Like, cause we can share a lie. That would be so easy. But yeah. the hard part for a lot of people is actually getting to that place of wanting to share the innermost parts of their story, which yeah. is, I've found it's freeing when you do do that, depending on who you actually speak to. Yeah. Uh, but for me, living in integrity, knowing my truth, knowing my worth, I'm now able to freely express whatever story in my life that I want. I'm not ashamed of it. I'm yeah. not daunted by it. And I yeah. feel like that for me brings a lot of peace and a lot of grounding. Yeah. And I actually, um, I got funny enough today, actually I got back the copy edit of my book, The Path of an Eagle. And it's, oh, not, beautiful. A take, it's not a takeaway from yours at all, but I want to sort of uh, mention the lies and, Depression is such a prevalent thing yeah. in society, but oftentimes depression creeps in when the young person tells himself lies. Yep. And I would say not often, but always. Always. There you go. Yeah. So in your, in your experience, like I actually write 21 lies that men believe about hmm. themselves, about life. And there's also, I couldn't write about this because I'm not a female 
Um, there's also lies that females tell themselves, but yeah. some, yeah. somehow a crossover between yeah. them. So is, yeah. there, is there one or a few lies, Martha, that you that you noticed as you're going through this journey that yeah. you believe the most, you found the most challenging to get rid of? Absolutely. Um, the book follows actually Dante's divine comedy. It starts, he starts out that poem saying, I, I came to myself in the middle of my life and I was lost in a terrible place. I didn't know how I got there. I didn't know how to get out. And the only way he gets out is to go through the inferno, which I take to be, you know, you go through and you meet your own inner demons and you have to go past them and then you come out the other side and he has to climb this mountain which i think is once you've looked inward at your demons and like found the truth that lay underneath then you can go on and start to walk your talk as he goes down through the inferno he gets to harder and harder issues to resolve and right at the very pit of hell is the monster lucifer who is um locked in a lake of ice. And I felt, I, I read this at 18 and I knew that in, in myself, I was locked in a lake of ice at the very center of myself. And that's what was causing my depression. And I had to go inward to find it. And I found relief from the deepest lie. And then I went on to be a coach and I found that everyone shares this deepest lie. And this lie is, I am not lovable. I am not okay. I'm not enough. I'm not good. It's it, whatever version. It's very simple as mm -hmm. I am bad. That is the most pernicious lie. And he gets there. He gets to that level of hell. And his guide says, keep going. And he says, there is no more down. I'm at the center of the earth. I'm as down as I can get. And he, the, the guide says, keep going. So he actually climbs on the body of the monster. And as he goes down past the hip, he passes the center of the earth. So now the same direction is not down, but up. He's headed toward the, so, uh, the sky. And when we get to, the, to that deep, deep live, I'm not enough. And then we turn everything on its head and, and we realize that we are absolutely, um, you know, infinite in our value, every single one of us. When you undo that lie, you are, he says, we came out to behold the stars, like almost immediately, boom, the world becomes beautiful. Um, depression lifts, anxiety goes away. Bec not because it's a happy story, but because it's true. Mm. And the misery isn't because it's a sad story, it's because it's a lie. Mm. And our bodies and our souls and our minds hate to lie. Mm. It kind of reminds me Dante's divine comedy and, and divine is, is talking about Dante's peak. I, I remember hearing about that when I was relatively young, but it mm -hmm. sort of reminds me, I don't know if you've heard of the Pilgrim's Progress. Yes, of course. It sort of reminds me of that, except it's not, we're not going down to the depths of hell, but he faces these giants or these monsters. Yeah in life while he's got this burden upon his shoulders and he's yep. he's given a, a set of like instruments as as he goes along the journey to help fight the the demons or yeah. the that's what it basically is and yeah. i feel like that's what i had to do in my life is mm -hmm. i had to make the choice firstly to face the demons of depression yeah of, anxiety of not feeling like I was enough. And I feel like people are afraid to actually face the demons because they're afraid of what they're going to find. Right. But actually, if you're afraid of the demons and you never face them, um, they, they will torture you for the rest of your existence. And when you do face them, here's what's really interesting. If you write down, here are the five things I don't want anyone to know about me. And then you change it. So it says, here are the five things I desperately want someone to know about me. They will be the same things. Because when someone knows what you have been hiding and loves it, has compassion on it, it sets you free from the lie. And that is everything. So having one compassionate witness who said, who can listen to your deepest shame. Shame is the lowest frequency emotion we can have, right? Shame and self-loathing. That is always, always, always based on something that isn't true. Mm -hmm. You go to a, a hospital ward with new babies and point out the baby that isn't good enough. 
it's not going to happen. Right. <laughs> like there is nothing imperfect about any of us. And like my son came in with an extra chromosome, absolutely perfect. He used to say, am I good? And I would just say, Adam, you're perfect. He go, just checking. <laughs> Just and sure. now my whole family will do that. We'll say to each other, you know, like I ran a red light. Am I, am I bad? No, you're good. <gasps> okay. Just checking. Mm -hmm. It's, it's like a little kid thinking, but we need to hear it over and over and over. We are good. We are good. We are good. At the very top of purgatory, Dante encounters his former um, beloved who died when she was 24, Beatrice. And he's so ashamed. She's this radiant being. And he's so ashamed of himself that he just looks down and starts to cry. And she says, no, no, no. I need you to disentangle yourself from fear and shame. So you no longer speak like one who dreams. And then he gets dunked twice in, in a river. One side makes him forget everything he's ever done wrong. And then the other side makes him remember everything he's ever done right. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he achieves full integrity. Mm -hmm. So think about that. What if you could actually let go of everything you've ever done wrong and hold within you everything you've ever done right? I think this whole life is like panning for gold. There's a lot of dross in there. We go in for the jewels and we can go through a lot. We can handle a lot of ugly rocks. But if we come out with the jewels of what life was meant to be for us and, and the compassion and the courage and the love that comes from suffering through difficulty, everything bad washes away in the end and everything that's left is absolutely precious. Mm. Part or stage three in your book is actually purgatory. And you talk about mm -hmm. uh, chapter 10 is no turning back. I love that yeah. title, by the way. So we, we shouldn't ever turn back and see all the pain, all the hurt, all the anxiety, because there is a moment when, I don't know if you've researched trauma much, but trauma oh, is yeah. what your body remembers. So the moment oh, yes, it does. turn back and we remember it, we start remembering all those feelings of I'm not enough. And then we can get yeah. go back through the same same place. We and need to do that though. I mean, with, with trauma, you need someone to hear that compassionately. And that's what happens to Dante when Beatrice does that for him. In my case, I was sexually abused as a child by my father. Mm -hmm. And at the end of my year, toward the end of my year of not lying at all, when I was 29, I ended up in surgery. And I, in the middle of the surgery, I woke up, sat up on the table, watched the surgeons operating. And then thought, wait, wait, what? And looked and my body was still on the table and I was so confused. And I lay back down and I looked up between the surgical lights and I, another light appeared. It was really small at first and it was so bright and so beautiful. It made the surgical lamps look dim. And as it grew, it filled things with it. It didn't bounce off them and it touched me, my body. And I was absolutely filled with this incredible, incredible warmth and love and sweetness. I was home. I was home. And there was so much joy in it, so much laughter. Mm -hmm. And it, this light said to me, you know, you are going to go through some really hard things in the next decades of your life. And just remember, I'm always right here. I'm always right here. And I woke up so full of joy. And in the next few weeks, I just, the whole trauma thing hit me and it just all of the stuff that I'd suppressed and, you know, minimized and everything, it came out as if it were happening in real time. That's really important. And you need trauma specialists to help you with that. Mm -hmm. If that's part of your integrity walk, get some help. You need it. That said, there's a point where the the guide tells him not to look back. And that's when it's, it, he has to climb this mountain. But once he's free from fear and shame and he enters paradise, they actually, the angels there actually have him, or Beatrice has him look down at the earth and see his whole life. And he calls it the little threshing floor that so incites our savagery. It's just everything that was brutal and cruel and wrong looks so small to him once he's realized what and who he really is, the good in us is so much bigger than all the suffering we have. 
and suffering is huge, but we are so much bigger. Mm-hmm. And there will be a time when you look back and right now I can look back and say, yeah, that, that an awful, awful thing happened to me when I was a child. And, um, and it's, it's okay. It's fine. The, the happiness that I have and the peace that I have so completely engulfs that, that it's just a speck of dust. Mm. I appreciate you sharing that, the deep and personal part of your story, because I can relate to a little bit of it in terms of I was sexually abused by a, a teenage boy when I was six. So <laughs> I know, I, I can't, I kind of know somewhat the, the feeling that yeah. you were alluding to. And I'm so sorry. No, no, it, it's, it's okay. Cause I've done the journey and I've, I say I've forgiven him and huh. hold no remorse, no malice, nothing yeah. to resent him at all. And yeah. I sort of, I reached my place of, okay, I, the moment I did turn back, yeah. I, I noticed that I was free. Yeah. I was, mm. and, that, and that feeling of freedom for me was, it was an amazing experience. Yeah. I, I talk about it. Um, I'm actually working on um, my believe it or not, my fourth book. <laughs> uh, towards- yeah, you are a really slow starter, Jay. I mean, gosh, <laughs> Tell me you're about like it. 25 and you've only written four books. <laughs> I just keep going. But I had this idea come onto my heart and mind and I'm like, are you sure uh, if you believe in God, I, I believe it was him. I, I'm like, are you sure you want me to write about this? Are you, are you, are you certain I'm the right person? He said, just, just start writing and we'll see how we go. <laughs> Mm -hmm. (laughs) um, i i sort of opened up a little bit more about how i arrived at the place of forgiveness there's so many different paths that we can take but it all leads us towards the one place which is ultimately Mm -hmm. forgiveness like whether or not you've been abused whether or not uh, you've been betrayed doesn't matter what it is what path you take it leads you towards forgiveness yeah. But, but we mustn't jump and wait. And for anybody out there who has suffered at the hands of anything, a, a cruel system, a cruel person, you don't just grit your teeth and say, I forgive you. No. You, you have to go through your own inferno, through the feelings of shame and self betrayal that you took with you from that experience. You've got to turn the truth of I'm not lovable around into the truth of I'm infinitely precious. And then you climb your own mountain and you look down from your peace, from your joy, and you see this the, this savage thing that happened, and it's so tiny from the place you are that you realize, for me, it was just, I just one day realized I'd forgiven. I never made, I tried at first to like forgive right away and get past it, didn't work. So I had to live and go through the grieving and all the emotions involved with it, including a lot of anger. If mm-hmm. you've been abused in any way, it's a very natural defensive healthy defensive reflex to say that's not okay and once you and that's all integrity you have to be willing to face the way it feels to face what really happened to face your shame at exposing that story to face the eyes of somebody you tell and risk opening all the wounds again and then in the end you have to face your own perfection and the fact that in the eyes of the universe there is nothing wrong with you and there never was mm, that's beautiful it really is um Martha, you're 24 and you already know it. <laughs> it it was like like i was saying it was this incredibly difficult journey i think everything just sort of at one point in 2019 that was the the whole journey the whole year and really if i'm being honest with with all of you and I have, I probably shared this maybe once or twice, but I was so fed up with my life, with everything that was going on. I was so angry at myself for the way mm-hmm. that my life had ended up really that I wanted to just end it all. And I actually tried to end it all. But the amazing story in all of this is I'm driving my car at 140 kilometers an hour down this straight road and I was aiming for the telegraph pole at the very end. I planned it out to a T and I just let go of the wheel 
and <sighs> allowed the car to just go straight towards the telegraph pole. But the amazing thing, Martha, in, in all of this, and you, you know the reason why I believe you, your ball, you, your son creating that ball of energy is because mm-hmm. I watched, I took my f- hand off the wheel, my foot was on the accelerator and I watched the car steering wheel turn away from the telegraph pole and then I didn't even feel my, my foot come off the accelerator and on, onto the brake and my car came to a complete stop. Oh my God. And then I just broke down in tears and cried out and said, I need a miracle in my life right now. I just need to feel like something is happening in my life because I feel like nothing is happening. I feel like I'm not going anywhere. I feel like I'm absolutely useless. And I didn't have the radio on, funny story. I just turned it all off because I wanted peace and quiet while I just hit hit the telegraph pole. So my car's at a complete stop and for some reason I turned on the radio to a station that I never really listened to and the song came on the radio as I had said, I Need a Miracle. The song is titled I Need a Miracle by Third Day. Oh, my gosh. (gasps) You can't make this stuff up. Like you really can't. And that's the kind of thing that happens routinely when people really get honest it's we live in a world full of that as i said i was in when i was pregnant with with my son i was in a high-rise fire and i was going down a a staircase thinking i'd get below the fire i was on the 10th floor but the fire was in the basement and it was sending smoke up that staircase like a chimney there was no oxygen in there were people you couldn't see anything people screaming and rushing past and bumping it you could not see your hand in front of your face i had my 18 month old daughter trying to hold her under my coat but after about i don't know eight or nine staircases i was blacking out it was like you'd try to breathe and it was like breathing needles you didn't have any sense of oxygen at all and i finally fell down um, and people were bumping and rushing and i tried to push my daughter forward so that someone would kick her down the stairs because I was losing it. I mean, there were stars in my in my vision. My eyes were going weird. And uh, I knew I was dying of suffocation. And then I felt this very strong set of arms grab me by the shoulders and lift me to my feet and like frog march me down another two flights of stairs and then push me or carry me really out into the into the sunlight. And I just started coughing so violently and just grabbing for oxygen. And I just, I turned around and to thank him and there was nobody there. And then later there was news footage of, of me coming out of the smoke and there's no one behind me. I'm just there with my daughter. So I completely believe you. And yet when you said that, it's still like, wow, when it actually happens and you're looking right at it and the culture says it can't happen, but it's happening. Like the world expands so far beyond the horizons that you've been taught to look at. And and it's just like, wow, why was I in that, in that little threshing floor? So I'm really, what happened after that? Like, did, how did you internalize that? Well, I, I literally like in that moment, as I was saying, I, I cried out to God and I said, God, I need you to do something in my life here. I need you to change my mindset. I need you to do just do something to get me away from this pain that I'm I'm experiencing because yeah. I was just tired of it. Like my life was going oh, I hear you. nowhere. Yeah, and um, it wasn't like this. My life changed the very next day dramatically. It was. It took a bit of time, but that's when I believe God was doing the work in my life. Like He yeah. He gave me the sense of peace. He's like. No matter what you're going through, Jay, everything is going to be okay. Yeah. Not because you say so, because I say so. And having that exactly. having that mindset, I think going into my job the very next day, facing more verbal and mental abuse from mm. the place that I was at, I was just like, you can't hurt me anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> so exactly. And that Yeah, I remember. Me. Um, Some family members coming. I wrote a book about leaving Mormonism and I got death threats. I knew I would. My father was very central in the in the church. And um, 
I got death threats and I got legal threats and someone killed all the plants in my yard. And um, I had to have bodyguards on that book tour. And um, I just through the whole thing. There was the peace that passeth understanding. And I remember looking at some of my family members who hadn't talked to me for years and they came to tell me they'd, they were going to have a DA prosecute me and put me in prison for the rest of my life. And I'd never see my children again. And, and I remember sitting there and thinking, everything's okay. Everybody, I love you all so much and everything's fine. And I, it made no earthly sense, but by then I'd realized that what is truth to the soul generally makes no earthly sense to any culture. Mm. Right. So I was, I was, I was horrified. Obviously I was in some ways terrified, but I, I'd done the same thing you did, Jay. I'd gone to the point where I was very tired of life. And I actually thought I was going to be killed by a rhinoceros. Actually, I, I, I remember being suicidal at the age of six. And that just sort of persisted until I was in my 40s where it wasn't really strong. But it was like, man, I could come or go. And I was tracking rhinos in Africa. And I, I tracked right up on, an, on a rhino with my friends. And um, I really thought it was going to kill me. It was a mother with a calf. And she was very agitated. And I remember thinking, this is how I die. This is so cool. I'm going to be killed by a rhinoceros. And I let go of my entire life, just truly let go. And this was right after this book tour where all this had broken loose. And the entire, everything ahead of me that I thought was going to end in death expanded into this field of magic. Mm. And I just saw an entirely new life ahead of me. Like everything had been shed. And I went forward from that point thinking, okay, this is a good ride. And let's, as, as Toni Morrison said, the function of freedom is to free someone else. Mm -hmm. And I felt so free. And I, all I want now is to free other people, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what you're doing, which is like, really at your age, you're a mere toddler. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It, it's really an honor hearing that from someone like yourself, honestly, uh, it, I, I don't do it for fame. I don't do it for notoriety. I don't do it for people to, you know, pump me up at all. I do it. And despite the, the struggle that it actually is like mm. going from literally nothing, no one knowing who you are to being able to speak to you today, Martha is just like, it's been one heck of a journey and wow. I've loved each and every step of the way. You know, and even the hard parts, even the difficult parts, the discouraged parts, the sleepless nights. And I can <laughs> this will sound very California, but I can feel it as you're talking. My, I'm actually feeling all these surges of energy and interesting, like tingles and heat and this sense of, oh, that's that landed. And there's all this stuff happening energetically that I couldn't feel before I decided to just drop the culture and be in my true nature. Mm. And, and I can feel it coming from you. And um, Oprah interviewed me a few weeks ago and I felt it coming from her and we talked about it. And same thing, somebody born in complete, like an illegitimate black girl born in Mississippi in the 1950s, like not a big chance this woman was going to change the world. And yet she did. And that energy comes and picks people up and it picks everybody up. Mm. Every single one of us is worthy of that every single one of us, but you have to face your truth. And I'm just so grateful you've faced yours, Jay, because you're, you're setting so many other people free. I hope so. I really do. What I feel do you, it. Thank you, Martha. And it's amazing how we can actually feel it through zoom. Like you don't right? be in person. <laughs> I know. <laughs> how many miles apart are we? Oh, million, thousands of miles, actually. Thousands of miles. And it's just, I can feel you as strongly as if you were in the room. Mm. Like it, it's just, that's one of the things that happens when you get into truth. And it has to do with your neurology. They, they now know that you reach this state and I'm not at it yet, but uh, I think I'm on the way. I think you're on the way where you are using your brain in such a way that the sense of a separated self goes away and a sense of control goes away. So you lose the two things that our culture says you need more than anything, a self and control. <laughs> and at that point, your brain lets go. You become one with everyone so that I can feel you and you can feel me, even though we're thousands of miles apart. 
And the control is taken, as you said, by whatever you want to call God, Mm -hmm. by the force, the Tao, the divine, whatever. You don't have to do anymore. You just allow yourself to be a vehicle through which love can travel. Mm -hmm. And that's home. Mm -hmm. And that's worth staying on the planet for. I love saying, and what gives me in comfort is let go and let God. Yeah. Yeah. I like the Zen feeling, uh, phrase, don't push the river. It runs by itself. Yes. <laughs> that is so and that's what, when Dante gets to paradise where he's in total harmony, he can go anywhere just with a thought and he sees all these beings of light and he's told we're all one. We just appear different because it's beautiful. It's all for the beauty of it. And when the, the the beings of light want to talk to him, they glow more brightly, but everything's telepathic. So he went into this brain state and it's not a fantasy. It's something that happens reliably. And it's happened to people around the globe throughout history. In Asia, it's called awakening or enlightenment. In Western, the Western world, it's called crazy. <laughs> you know, but it's real. Not only that, but one neurologist that I quote in the book says, not only is it a real state of being, but it is a state of being for which we are biologically programmed to seek. Mm. Like when pe- the number one pain people feel is that they don't have a sense of purpose. I've talked to people who don't have enough money, who are homeless on the streets, who are in prison. And the one thing that hurts the most is they don't have a sense of purpose. And when you get back your sense of purpose, then um, you you arrive in this place. I, I like to say that whenever you pray for something, uh, the universe immediately answers yes and immediately sends it to you. But the catch is that whenever I've talked to anyone in any part of life, if I have them say the thing that makes them feel the ring of truth the most, it's always I am meant to live in peace. So if you say that, or if your listeners want to say that out loud, I am meant to live in peace and feel the way that resonates through your body, your mind, your heart, your soul. So when the universe sends us the things we've called out for, we've cried out for, it never sends them to despair because that's not our home. It sends them to peace because that's our real home address. So then when you get to peace, all the things you've cried out for are they're waiting for you. Peace is our home. Integrity is the way to it. And everything we long for meets us there. Mm. And I think that's what you're showing all your listeners. Mm. I love that saying. I think I'll be repeating it for the rest of the day. <laughs> to be honest with you. I like saying as well that what I've realized in my life and I, I teach, I try and teach it to other people is that you have to understand, you've got to believe that you right now is a purpose. You were created with a purpose. Being yeah. you is a purpose. You don't have That's to be, all it is. Yeah. You don't have to be uh, like Oprah. You don't have to be like that. She's living in her own purpose. She's yeah. being who she was designed to be. I think it's just being in a place of great gratitude of who you are. That's, yeah. that's powerful. And I think culture has conditioned us because when I was growing up, yeah, I'd be asked a question. So what do you want to be when you go up, Jay? And I said, oh, I want to, I, or I'd say, and I associate it with, I am a filmmaker or I am mm. this. The mm. moment we say I am, we associate purpose to it. Right. And work. right. So if we start distinguishing between I am versus I do, we can start yeah. living in peace and prosperity. That's really a great insight. And you know, when I was in that surgery and I was with the light, um, it said to me, I, I thought I can't wait till I die because I want to feel this way again. So when I say I was suicide after the age of 29, I never wanted to like actively kill myself, but I desperately wanted to die because I thought it would be like that. You read the near death experiences. There's light. It feels amazing. I was hoping that was the same light. And I would like, if a pet died, I would feel jealous. Like, I wonder if they got a little tiny white light, (laughs) but when it was talking to me telepathically, it said, don't think you have to die to feel this way. In fact, your purpose in life, and maybe all of our purpose, I don't know, is to learn to feel this way while you're in this body, Mm -hmm. is to learn to feel this amount of joy, this freedom from suffering, this amount of of the, the absolute amazement and awe 
of seeing the world from this material form. Sure, it's not going to last forever, but oh my God, what a ride. Mm. And you should be this happy, they told me. And so that's when I came out and left my family, my religion, my marriage, everything. Like anything that didn't feel like that light, gone. Mm. And um, yeah, I think now I feel about 95% of that. You know, I I touch it every day. Mm. I can... I can see why people need to go and get this book <laughs> 100%. So where can people go and buy it, Martha? Where can people connect with you as well before I ask you the final two questions? Um, just online, like as if we haven't been doing everything online anyway. But um, yeah, MarthaBeck.com. I'm on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all the things. So yeah, and go to Amazon to get the book if you like. Um, yeah. Or steal it from a friend. I don't know. <laughs> Take it off their bookshelf. <laughs> exactly. I want you to read it more than I want you to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main thing. So, Martha, this is my second last question for you. Really, really enjoy this conversation. What do you love the most about yourself? Oh, I think what I love the most about myself is my endless, like, pit bull obstinacy at wanting to be happy like i just i do not like suffering i don't like it and i will not have it <laughs> and it's it makes me quite annoying but it's done me well so i like that i like that that's cool i love how you said pitbull <laughs> yeah pitbull tenacity never let go <laughs> i like it um Ma, this is my final question for you is my all-time favorite question i ask everyone at the end it's a hypothetical one, but I want you to imagine with me for a moment that you've been able to reach the age of 100. All your mm -hmm. friends and your family have decided to put together a film for you of everything you've ever said and everything you've ever done. Don't ask me how in the world they got it all. We'll call it magic for the sake of argument. But they've been able to get it and show it to you on your 100th birthday. What do you mm -hmm. want that film to say and to show about your life? I want it to say that my life brought life, capital L, more fully into the world to the, to the point where in that film, you don't even notice me. You just see the beauty of the world and of love and of God. Uh, and I disappear. That's what I want. I feel like that's a perfect send off message. Martha Beck, thank you so much for your time today, for your energy. Thank you for your time and your whole life. Thank you. I can't thank you enough. <laughs> this Mwah, is I'm giving you a huge air hug. Me too. 10,000 mile uh, hug. <laughs> <laughs> I, I embrace it. I accept it. Thank you for coming oh, on the Thank you. Podcast. Thanks for having me.